Welcome back to my channel. This is Quantum Visions, and in this video, we're about to touch on how Big Pharma is making healthy people sick. Now, I know firsthand about pharmaceuticals. That's what I do. That's my day to day job. However, I do feel like people should try to take different alternatives before jumping straight into a particular type of medication they may have more side effects than your body actually is equipped for um especially if you're going through like depression and anxiety and those type of things you probably want to try to find something a, a little bit more healthier but that's a that's between you and your doctor that's between you and your doctor and how y'all want to go about doing things and what's okay for you Okay, I don't want to give anybody any type of um, wherewithal to do what I'm saying. And then something happened to you. And then you say, oh, this guy on the YouTube video said don't do this or whatever. So whatever you and your doctor come up with, whatever the plan is, you, you go ahead on with that. But let's just take a look and see what these people are going through. And if you can relate, uh, leave a comment in the comment section. Uh my channel does not have any complete thing that I talk about. I talk about several different things. So this video, you may find it interesting and somebody may not. So just bear with me and uh, let's take a look and see what's going on. <laughs> Typically, we find that the withdrawal phenomenon is the opposite of whatever the drug does. If the, the intention of the drug is to help somebody be more relaxed or help them fall asleep, then when they're experiencing withdrawal, what they will experience is anxiety and restlessness and insomnia. It may even get so bad that they you know, are profoundly depressed and consider suicide. The withdrawal symptoms can often be much worse than the original problems the person came with. And the withdrawal is very, very difficult, sometimes quite dangerous, it may take months or years to really be accomplished. I People actually, I was going through depression at one time and anxiety, and they gave me a medicine called uh, Zoloft. And I mean, I worked in a pharmacy, but I ain't never really like understood the effects and the withdrawal effects. So they gave it to me for about a month and I, I I took it every day, and I, I was feeling fine. And after feeling fine, I decided to stop taking the medicine. So after I stopped taking the medicine, the first day I was okay. The second day I kind of felt weird, but that third day. That third day, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I felt like I was going crazy. I had the weirdest vertigo. I did not know what the hell was going on. And I dealt with that because I didn't want to take the medicine no more because I was feeling fine. You would assume that if you're taking a medication to make you feel something, or if you're taking something to make you feel a certain way, and once you get to that point, you can just stop. But with that particular medication, and I guess a lot of others, you can't. You have to figure out a way to wean yourself off of these medications before going cold turkey. You can't go cold turkey. It's damn near impossible because you're going to have some type of side effect. Let's continue. Out of their skin, feeling terrific anxiety, having all sorts of physiological symptoms that are difficult to bear. People cannot stop this medicine except in the slowest possible way See? with very gradual reductions in dose. That's a fact. I, I knew that firsthand. I experienced it. It was very difficult. So it this was. is how I cut my pills. So I'm doing here a 10% a taper. So I take the pill. I weigh it. So a whole pill at 2 milligram weighs... 0 0.15, 90, 10% of that. You don't want to 
take off too much because you're gonna waste the pills. So it's almost there actually. That's 10%, yeah. The first time I tapered, I didn't have my scale as yet. So I was just eyeballing because I was determined to get off. Well, your body will tell you if you're handling the cuts based on symptoms. So it took me a while to get from two to 1.6. It was 1.64, that's all I could go. That's crazy. See, this group has um, almost 2,300 members. Just her demeanor to me, like she she hates the fact that she have this problem. Like you can tell just by the look on her face that she des despises the reaction that she has to this medication and the fact that he, she even has to go through this is is something that she she just hates with every fiber of her being. Post stuff. How's everyone doing today? Let's see. I'm in a strange window today. Up dose for almost two days. Up dose is when you're at a certain dose and the symptoms get really bad, so you go back to the original dose where you weren't feeling so bad. Everyone has a unique stuff running through you. No two persons are alike. I had brain zap. I had tremors. I had severe night sweats. I have a symptom where it feels like things are crawling inside my body, just, just moving. And I came across this image and I was like, wow, Damn. that's exactly how, that's exactly how it is. Nobody understands this. And if you don't have support, you will lose yourself. I've been a part of these groups since August of last year. And since August of last year, we lost three people to suicide Damn. in my support groups. Three. We lost a 50 something year old woman whose doctor cold turkeyed her off of clonopin. And she suffered. And she has two little boys. And she walked in front of a train because she couldn't deal with it anymore. About that a month ago, we that lost- That shit is hard. I, I can only imagine, like, for real. <sighs> the withdrawals, it's not something to play with. And you got to be careful like I, I was if 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 is if you can try to limit as much medication as you can and try to find something natural that has no side effects i mean if you can if you can 40 something year old guy he shot himself in the head blew his blew his head off so we're losing people in this fight. I think about it all the time. What if my symptoms get to the point where I can't make it? What am I going to do? Let's hope not. Let's hope she's able to make a full recovery. Let's go back to the start of this disease model in the 1980s, okay? Now the first drug that was tested in this new era was Xanax, Alprazolam, for panic disorder. And here was the study they conducted. They compared Xanax versus a placebo group, and the primary outcome measure was the number of panic attacks on average per week. And after four weeks, Xanax was doing better. Fewer panic attacks. At eight weeks, the Xanax patients were doing no better than placebo. And then at the end of 14 weeks, wow. the Xanax patients were doing worse than they were at the beginning. Wow. And much, much worse <laughs> than the placebo patients. Wait. The <laughs> Y'all see the numbers. Look at this. It's almost like the Xanax is the placebo. That's that's what it looked like to me. The Xanax is the placebo. Because you, you're taking a sugar pill or whatever they use to feel the, the placebo. And you're thinking it's medicine. But your body, you you are mentally believing that something good is coming out of this. However, the Xanax is giving you an adverse reaction to what you already believe that you're trying to do. So if all of them would have had placebos, these numbers would be down, which is me, which means that they didn't need the medication to get what they were. The placebo people did not need the medication. It's all mental. You have to mentally prepare yourself for where you're trying to be. 
They did not need that. But the Xanax people, I feel sorry for those people because now they even, they're worse off than they were at the beginning. The placebo people double down on what the Xanax people increased on. It's, it's crazy. Trial told of harm done. It told the people who were going to get addicted. When they came off, they'd have so, all sorts of withdrawal symptoms and some people unable to get off. Okay, so That's what the study showed. What did they report? They didn't report the eight-week results. They focused on the four-week results mm. because that was the story that told of an effective new treatment for panic disorder. Wow, that's... And completely hid the 14-week results. That's false advertisement because you're not giving me the full story. You're showing me the good parts and you're leaving out the bad parts. So now I'm believing in only the good parts when the good parts was me not taking anything at all. Pretty soon, Xanax became one of the best-selling drugs in the country. It is still, still prescribed today. left and right. That's and 2013. And what did we have in the early it's 80s? 2023. They're still story getting it. Of science that told of harm done. The longer you take a study out, the more likely you are to see people not doing well on that drug, right, or developing side effects from that drug. So, the pharmaceutical industry doesn't favor long-term studies for monetary reasons and for outcome reasons. They they don't want to show that their drug actually doesn't do well. The gorilla in the room is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, the drug companies spend something like $80 billion a year on marketing and lobbying. They spend much, much less on research, and most of the research they do is really a tool of marketing. There's a I do agree, but however, we also have to look at these doctors. Okay, if these doctors are getting paid under the table, are getting stipends for making sure that they prescribe this amount of medication to this patient, it starts there. That's where it starts, in the doctor's office, in the clinics, wherever the doctors are, you have to go and see them. That's where all of this starts because the doctors are going to write the prescriptions for the patients. The pharmacist can't do that. The pharmacist cannot give a patient a Xanax or an oxycodone or a Zan or whatever you want to call it, a clonazepam or a, a Ambien or any of those medications, tramadol or gabapentin or any of that, the pharmacist cannot give that to you without your doctor writing an okay slip. Yes, here, this patient can take this medicine, give it to him. Now, if your doctor does that, then they try to put the onus on the pharmaceuticals which i get it because it looks like the pharmacists are pumping it out no the doctors are pumping it out it starts in the doctor's offices remember that as, as much marketing in the tests that are devised to measure the outcomes in the investigators that are hired to conduct the study all of that stuff is marketing but it's presented and manufactured and published as science so here's how it's done and how it was done. The pharmaceutical companies funneled all sorts of money to what are called thought leaders. Academic psychiatrists okay. at prestigious American universities, Harvard, Stanford, Johns Hopkins, and those academic psychiatrists began working for the drug companies as consultants, serving as their speakers, advisors, etc. You would start with a clinical study of the drug, but who's designing the study? The pharmaceutical companies, they know how to design it to make their drug look good. That's step one. Mm. Who then analyzes the data? Well, their own people do it. It's done by the drug companies themselves. Third then, who writes the papers? It's actually ghostwriters hired by the drug companies to write up the study. They now present this study to the people that they want to be the big names of the study. And then those thought leaders basically sign off on the ghost-written papers, and they. Be so it's not the it's not the doctors, it's not the pharmacies, it's the actual pharmaceutical companies who's coming up with the propaganda to display to the people. That's that's what I'm getting. That's what you're getting to say. I. Right. Um. Quote the authors of the published paper. The former editors of the medical journals like JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine and BMJ, British Medical Journal, they've all said that like basically we became vehicles for story laundry. It was a corrupted creation of an evidence base. Damn. Now this game, you're not ready for it. Now, I'm a practicing doctor in some town. 
what am I going to believe? Well, I'm going to believe, you know, Mr. Dr. Bigwig at Harvard University that this is the best science. So my obligation is to use the very drug they say is so great. So for example, Prozac. Prozac didn't really work in the trials. Prozac had all sorts of adverse effects. And those of us who are old enough to remember when Prozac came to market, it was the drug itself was on the cover of magazines. Damn. Our powers are such now that we can give you Prozac, whatever personality you want. A breakthrough want. drug for depression. Our knowledge is advancing. Prozac, that was the story told. Pills for the mind. What did science So they, they marketed this shit like a McDonald's Grimace burger or some shit. So did you know what they found? In the 1970s. Very first studies done in Germany. What do they see? All sorts of psychotic events. A worsening of depression, homicidal, suicidal impulses, so much that the German authorities said, this is a dangerous drug. We're not going to approve it. And now go read the, the studies that were reported by the Americans. The psychosis is gone. The homicidal problems are gone. Imagine you're a mother, and I know mothers, who said to their kid who got depressed over breaking up with a, a girl or something like that. The doctor says, oh, Prozac doesn't increase suicide risk, and then a week later, that kid hangs himself. That's in a real case. <laughs> Can you think of any worse corruption of that? It has been shown that half of the deaths that occur in psychiatric drug trials, they're never published. They disappear. <laughs> you have an expression in America, torture your data until they confess. And this happens all the time. The difference between an honest data analysis and one you have manipulated can be worth billions on the world market. So what do you think they'll So they they want the data to be skewed a certain way so that it looks good and everybody's able to benefit off of the demise of the people who's going to be taking the medicine. And that is messed up. It's messed up. Say smile with Prozac and laugh to the bank with Eli Lilly. <laughs> It says, Mother's Little Anti-Psychotic is worth $6.9 9 a year. It says, BioVail Corp. Profit soars on strong sales of antidepressant Wellbutrin. Sales of antidepressant soar as we become the molecule in Ritalin keeps generating revenue. This brother. Faced with a shortage of Adderall, Maker jacks up the price and double sales. Wow. That's been going on since August of 2022. And there, we still got a shortage. Like, we, we still ain't got everything that you would want. And then the stuff that we can get, we hitting the limits on it. So we can't even get it in, even if it is available. Because too many people switched over and... It's just a it's just a disaster. Like I don't understand what's going on these days. Medicine that people need on a daily basis outside of the psychotics and Adderall and all of that. Can't get it. It just can't get it. Like I don't understand. Depression drug market. They they jump they ready for twenty twenty four. I'm still nowhere near the person that was, but this is how I explain it to my wife. Like, I know I love her. I know I can remember, I can recall the feelings and the sensations of when we met, when we dated, when we got married. Um, but I don't feel love. I don't feel love for her. I don't feel love for my dog. I don't feel love or connection. I mean, it's almost like I don't feel for other people's concerns or feelings or emotions. Um, and I think that's multifaceted. I think it's partly the drugs. I think it's partly brought on by the severe trauma of going through the experience. Wow. And I'm, I'm going to stop it right there. It's crazy that the medication can make you feel nothing. It can make you not like anyone. It can make you not even love your own wife or don't don't love anybody your dog nothing 
You damn near even love yourself because you don't even understand why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. And it's the medication that you've been taking. I mean, only your doctor can help you figure out what you want to do with your life mentally for your own health. And if the taking the medication is the only option that you got, you got to do what you got to do. But then there's other options. If there's other options, you may want to address those other options. I'm just saying. If y'all want to see more videos like this, hit the like and subscribe. Let's get it. Oh, don't forget to leave a comment in the comment section about this. And if you want to share a story about you having some type of depression or going through some type of withdrawals with your medication, we hear. We, we, we comment back, whatever. If you need talk, we can talk. Let's go. Peace. Oh, my God.